This is cassette number 122 in the Capitalist Reporter Commercial Intelligence Program. We'll be speaking with Richard Berman, feature editor of the Capitalist Reporter, and an expert in teenage business opportunities. In fact, when Berman himself was 15 years old, he was making $125 a week as a magician at children's parties. Mr. Berman, what are the hottest teenage business opportunities today? Well, in every case, uh, it's a matter of finding a need, finding the need in your area, and then promoting it like crazy. Uh, for example, in New York City now, health foods are a big thing, and so I'd say the biggest teenage opportunity right now is what's called a health food push cart. Uh, kids are taking a cart and, and putting daisies and flowers all over them, and uh, selling health food, which has a fantastic markup. Uh, all over the city. This is uh, summer now in New York City, and I know some kids who are making over uh, $300 a week using these health food push cards. Would you say that the real problem facing a kid is that he just doesn't know where to begin? To him it seems very complicated, and he thinks, oh boy, what a job, what a problem, and that mental inhibition just puts him off, it turns him off, and he never starts anything. So how would a kid really get started if he feels he has a good idea? Well, uh, opportunity is all around you, even in the most unlikely places. And uh, you just have to look around you and, and, and find a need and fill it. In my own case, uh, I, I, when I was 15 years old, I lived in an area <coughs> where there were a lot of row homes and a lot of children. And I'd say uh, in any given week in that area, uh, it was the Overbrook Park section of Philadelphia, there must have been oh, at least 50 children's birthday parties. So I became a magician. Uh, I went to a magic store and uh, I started out with only $25 worth of equipment, uh, which is what I charged per party, and I was doing an average of five parties a week and making $125 a week uh, as a 15-year-old high school student. So you have to look around uh, your neighborhood, uh, uh, read the papers, uh, and, and listen to some of the suggestions that we're going to get into uh, later on in this cassette. Did you have any... Um business problems of actually running this kid magician enterprise I mean did you file tax returns did you start a, did you register a company or what uh, no I just put a little ad in, in, in a, uh, a local community paper saying mr. magic master magician for all occasions and uh, of course I, I, w I was almost always uh, paid in cash I, and uh, but but you have to be very creative in your promotion for example uh, they had a Cub Scout Blue and Gold Banquet in Philadelphia one year in which over 200 Cub Scout troops were represented. So I went down there with a little business card I had and I went up and I talked to the um, scout leader in each booth, told him I was a magician and that I, that I had a special show ready for their blue and yearly Blue and Gold Banquets and uh, to be sure and remember me when, when that came around. Well, for that one day's promotion, I ended up getting 34 shows. So what you're saying is there really was no out-of-pocket expenses in actually promoting your business and that everything you made was really clear profit. Once I bought my, my initial set of magic tricks from a, a magician supply dealer, and there's, there's one in every big city uh, listed in the yellow pages, uh, once I, I put out that initial expense, <clears throat> aside from small ads I took out in the community paper, I had absolutely no overhead. Was this easier than you expected? Oh, it was blissfully easy. And, and basically what, uh, what uh, the mothers want at a children's party is, is a glorified babysitter. You know, it gives them a chance to, for 45 minutes, go away and chat with their friends and somebody else is taking care of the kids. Now, another idea for kids' parties would be to show films, show uh, Laurel and Hardy films, uh, show cartoon films, either buy or rent a projector, put, to take a little ad in your local paper, and uh, charge fifteen twenty dollars and go around showing films at children's parties. This is a very popular event. I think, Mr. Berman, this illustrates um, an important function of the capitalist reporter, which is, as we say for many of the business opportunity stories that are printed, is that that particular business, that particular opportunity, is started on a simple idea. And so many people go astray by starting something that's complicated. And so what you're illustrating here are simple ideas, and of course simple ideas that fill a real need. How about some other ideas you've come across? And I should say, ask you this first of all, um, did you ever 
Well, why did you stop? You were making $125 a week. Here was a pretty good thing. Um, how did your business career develop? Well, I stopped uh, essentially uh, when I had when I had to go into the army, but uh, but I didn't stop really then because I went on doing magic shows at uh, posts in Italy and Germany and uh, I made a great deal more than my uh, military salary uh, doing shows. So that that uh, that's uh, and when I got out of the service and became a journalist, uh, that was how my career ended. But as far as more ideas go, well, uh, I could point to a feature we just had recently in the Capitalist Reporter of a 15-year-old in New York City who's making over $20,000 a year running a dog walking agency. And he doesn't walk the dogs himself. He doesn't have to. Now he has 20 employees who walk the dogs, and he takes a commission. And again, all he did was begin with taking out local ads in small papers, and the word of mouth grew, and, and, and now he, uh, he can't handle the demand. In the case of that dog walker, he also added something else to his service, and that was... He literally gave everybody a very, very good deal. He didn't, didn't walk dogs. He, he was a babysitter for dogs in many ways. He looked after them. He provided special services. And again, this illustrates a point that if you're starting a business, try to be better than anybody else. But of course, in these instances, magic and dog walking, uh, someone listening might think that, well, these are very unique things and, and perhaps... Uh, uh, a little out of their realm. Some of the simplest things are big money makers. Uh, a, a lot a, a, tutoring, in, in fact, uh, is a way to make a make a great uh, extra income for students. And almost anything that you have uh, an ability and can be taught, if it's uh, mathematics or something regarding school, well, great. Or if it's skiing or giving guitar lessons or teaching languages, uh, there's a myriad of things. And who has, if someone's listening, I, I imagine. They have expertise in some area that they could make ma money teaching to someone else. Uh, now, as far as other simple ideas, start a babysitting agency. You know, if you, if you build it up, just like the dog walker, after a while you'll never have to babysit yourself. You'll have a little store of 25 babysitters, and you just answer the call, send them out, take a commission. Uh, there's a girl doing that in Indiana making over $200 a month, you know. Uh, a typing service. If a girl is a good typist, why not start a typing service? Advertise around a local university or local school. Um, put together job resumes. They're, they're, all these things are simple things, and you have to find the particular thing in your area, uh, find the need, and then promote like crazy. I think what we're discussing here boils down to two specific areas. Number one, a kid uh, performs a certain service. Um, in other words, he gives up his time, and for that he receives... Two dollars an hour, or whatever, three dollars an hour. Now, from then, of course, if he wants to expand, then he becomes really a businessman. That is, he plans his business, he plans the hiring of other people, and uh, the selling of his services. And I think that the key thing here, obviously, is is that a kid thinks as a businessman. He plans his time, and he plans for his expansion. <coughs> Uh, that's correct, uh, and uh, I wanted to continue with some further ideas. Uh, get a sporting concession in your area. Uh, all kinds of sport, school sporting events are going on, and somebody's got to sell the hot dogs and popcorn and souvenirs and what have you. Uh, get this concession, hire some people to run it, and again, here's another job where you can sit back and watch and, and make money. That reminds me of an idea I read somewhere uh, in which somebody at a, at a local uh, stadium got a whole lot of cushions. They picked the cushions up very cheap, and uh, this person was renting the cushions, and they were all colored in a very bright color so people wouldn't walk away with them, and renting them for every sporting event for 25 or 50 cents apiece. It's just these little ingenious ideas, and, and it just takes a little bit of thought uh, to make a lot of money. Now, uh, for girls, a very good idea, a very timely one, is to start a daycare center for mothers. Uh, women, uh, more and more the percentages show, uh, are going out and back to work again, and they need somebody to watch the kids. So uh, y you can handle maybe 10 or 15 children and, and make a great living that way. Well, here's an idea then. Uh, if a girl was going to provide this service, she should get um, letters of, t of testimonial letters from, from a few of the mothers that she had already done business with, and these letters she could prove to other mothers how responsible she was. Here's another one, a telephone answering service or a wake-up service. Um, a wake-up service is the simplest thing in the world. You just have to wake up first. 
and call it, get it, you know, promote this like anything else, take ads in the local papers, get uh, 30 or 40 people you have to wake up each morning. And uh, it doesn't take a great deal of ingenuity to do that, just uh, dialing the telephone. Um, you mentioned taking ads in, in the local paper. I think there's, a, there's something even better that could be done here, because an ad costs money. Uh, and often, too, uh, people don't believe ads. Now, here we have, let's say, a 14-year-old kid, a 13-year-old kid who's, who's operating a, a wake-up service. Now, this would be a great feature story in, in, in the local paper. And the way to go about this is to call up the local city editor and introduce yourself and say, I'm, my name is so-and-so, I'm 14 years old, I've started this business, it's going very well, would you be interested in doing a story on me? And uh, having been a, being an ex-reporter, I know that most editors were very, very interested in this very interesting human interest story. Certainly, publicity is a very important thing, and people don't realize how simple and easy it is to get publicity. Um, whatever your service is, find the unique angle in it. It may seem, it may seem to be the most uh, commonplace uh, service in the world, but somewhere you'll be able to find some unique angle that you can pitch to the local newspapers and radio stations. It would also help, too, if you gave some catchy name to your company, um, something that is easy to remember, something that's catchy, and the name, of course, must sum up what your, what your service is. Uh, the capitalist reporter had a, a story a few issues ago on four ladies who operated a, a wedding service. That is, they did all the planning and logistics of the wedding, but they picked a wonderfully catchy name for their business. It was called Wonderful Weddings. And so pick a good name because it's a great source of advertising. Uh, while you're on the subject of weddings, uh, if, if, if someone's inclined that way, become a professional photographer. Uh, a lot of money is paid for good wedding photos, photos of sporting events, so on and so forth. And here's another idea. Start a messenger service in your town. Again, begin to hire people, begin to pay commissions, and then you just sit back and watch them try things all over town. It seems to me, uh, when you mention a messenger service, that there's all kinds of bonding services that c you can be bonded for very, very little. Uh, now, so if you could say to your potential customers, look, uh, you can trust me because I'm bonded for $100,000, which sounds terribly impressive, but that bonding could only cost you very few dollars for, for a, a year. Uh, I think this could help you get business measurably. Again, for teenagers, is there a local coffee house? Is there a place for uh, kids to hang out? Why not get together with some friends, start a cooperative coffee house, get a friend who's a folk singer, uh, build this up on Friday and Saturday nights. Again, you've got a little business going for you. Um, it costs money to rent a space for a coffee, coffee house. Perhaps you could um, get space in your own basement or in a friend's basement. Uh, possibly go to your local church. Uh, many churches like to have um, kids coming to their church so they could be involved in community activities and possibly your local church or synagogue would give you space free and the important thing about starting a business is that your overhead is low. And if you could start out with free rent, uh, you're a big step forward in having a profitable business because your overhead would be very, very low. Speaking of low overhead businesses, I have a good one for you. Plant sitting. A lot of people go on vacation and have nobody to take care of their plants. And if you're, uh, let's say, the loner type, uh, you, all, you, all you do when you're a plant sitter is go around from house to house and uh, pour water in a pot. Uh, do you think you'd be able to handle that? Well, here's another idea. <laughs> we talked about a plant sitter. How about a house sitter? Um, people go away on vacations. They're away two or three weeks. The grass grows. The papers pile up often. And, of course, this is a perfect tip-off to any uh, local burglar. So offer a house sitting service. And you'll keep the grass cut. You'll keep the papers collected off and make it look like it's being lived in. And uh, this is great anti-burglar insurance. And then there's something that... that uh somehow has gotten a bad name to it, but, but is a terrific way for a teenager to make money, and that's door-to-door -door sales. And uh, you're, not, you're, you're not limited at all in any product. You can take around door-to-door -door if you want to work on your own, or you can work for a big company, uh, even a, a Fuller Brush, for example. Well, here's an idea. Why don't you go to your friends um, and find out who's, in, who's into making crafts, be it metalwork, be it uh, homemade candles or whatever, and collect their, their goods, buy it off them at the wholesale price, and go around door to door 
uh, in your neighborhood offering these crafts for sale. And uh, tell people these crafts make great birthday presents and, and, and gifts in general. And the added attraction, of course, is that these are made by kids in your local neighborhood. So whatever these people buy, they're helping your neighborhood. Telephone soliciting is another good way to make money. Uh, whether it's a product that uh, you, you decide to sell on your own or whether, again, you work for a company. And another one is product demonstrations. Uh, local department stores, uh, local shops very often uh, hire product demonstrators to try to promote a particular product. And each idea springs another. You know, it's just, uh, it's really a matter of finding a particular need in your community. And there are these so many little gaps to be filled, you know. One, I, I would suggest is simply reading the papers and maybe reading papers, reading out of town papers to get an idea what somebody's doing in another town that hasn't been done in your town or city. As I mentioned in New York now, uh, these health food push carts are a very popular thing. But as I understand it, they haven't as yet really caught on in other parts of the country. So that would be one example if someone had been reading the New York papers, they'd have read about these health food push carts and they said, hey, that's something I can start out here in St. Louis or wherever. Uh, getting back to uh, homemade crafts and, and specifically to candles, uh, the capitalist reporter had a story um, several issues ago on a fellow in Michigan, in a small town in Michigan too, and he was grossing about $1,000 a week candle making. Now, the interesting thing here was not the candle making because many, many people are making candles. The problem is selling the candles. And this fellow hit upon a very ingenious idea which could be applicable to any uh, teenager who wants to get into the business. Um, he approached church group fraternal orders uh, in his area and said, look, I'll make the candles you sell them to your members. And this was very convenient to these community groups because it was a chance for them to make money also. It was very good for the fellow making the candles because all he had to do was make candles. He didn't have to worry about selling them. So why don't you get together with some of your friends who are into candle making, uh, form a sort of a cooperative. And so then when you've got a ready supply of candles in all these ingenious shapes and scented candles and all kinds of candles, then go to your legion, go to your fraternal orders, church groups, whatever, and say, look, we've, we've got the product, you sell them to your members. Uh, brings to mind another capitalist reporter story, Shelley's All-Stars. And uh, you're very familiar with that one, the fellow who makes $100,000 a year playing with kids. And of course, Shelley uh, no longer has to play with the kids because Shelley has employees who play with the kids. So Shelley is free to uh, receive awards and go on television programs and uh, makes $100,000 a year for doing nothing. Now, Shelley is not a teenager. And I shouldn't say Shelley does nothing. I'm sure Shelley does a great deal. But Shelley's not a teenager, and I'm sure it'll take a long time to build yourself up to where you made $100,000 a year supervising kids at playgrounds and so on. But you can start small. Well, the interesting thing about Shelley is how small he really was when he started. Um, now here Shelley has a, a really a going business. He has a, an office. Uh, he has four or five minibuses to haul the kids around. But only four years ago, Shelley started with just a desk in his living room, an old beat up station wagon, and I think it's about a couple of hundred dollars. And the key thing here is that Shelley, who, or anybody, who now has a really big going business, started on literally peanuts. And you don't have to have a lot of money for a new business. Again, back to the key element, the key formula, a simple idea that fills a need. What about the idea of giving tours? Um, in almost every city, there's some attraction, and uh, maybe it's even an attraction that particularly interests you and you know a lot about. Um, why not, either if there are no tours being given, set them up and give them yourself? Well, why not contact the local tourist office in your town? Uh, the local chamber of commerce. Often there's maybe um, well, people passing by on the, on, on the highway and they stop to find out what's, what are the things to see. So you could get a sign made up and say, uh, assuming there are things worth seeing in your community, <laughs> and uh, let's say the, the, the tour leaves at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, but have a sign at the spot where tourists stop you know, to inquire the local attractions and charge, oh, let's say maybe a dollar, two dollars, or whatever you can charge. And maybe you'd like to call square dances. You know, there's a great need for that. Uh, a, a square dance caller takes a certain kind of voice and uh, a certain kind of ability, but somebody has to call these square dances, and it's time somebody got down to it and, and began calling them, don't you think? Absolutely, and the, and, and the matter here is to be flamboyant, be interesting. Um, too many people, when they start a business, they, um, they hide themselves. so that They don't stand out. 
And this, one of the secrets of a really good business is you're flamboyant. You're very PR conscious and you, you stand out from the crowd. And of course, if you stand out, even if you're a character, and don't worry about being talked about, because if you're talked about, that's free, that's free advertising, it's word of mouth advertising. Stand out, be different, be flamboyant, and right off, you know that people are going to be watching you and be attracted to what you're doing. But don't be obnoxious, of course. And uh, don't, feel, don't feel that you're above opening a shoe shine stand in a barber shop. Uh, this is another thing, or, or in a thoroughfare where a lot of people go by. This is another thing that can be built up to the point where you don't have to do any of the work. You get a lot of people working for you. And here's a very good idea. Uh, take psychological tests. Universities pay somewhere between 5 and $10 to test teenagers for various things, you know. Uh, maybe they're, maybe they're, usually they want to test a normal teenager and find out what his reaction is to various stimuli or what have you. And the way to do this is, Read the local university newspapers, and very frequently you'll see ads for psychological testing. Of course, if in New you're in New York, there are a lot of these ads in the Village Voice. You know, very often kids have um, specialized interests in which they really know something about uh, cars, for example. Uh, now, I heard of a, of a kid who really got a tremendous small business going, and was fixing up old phonograph players like. 20 years old, in fact they were like antiques and old radios. And uh, he was making about $2,500 a year. And he'd go around to junk stores, uh, old bazaars, whatever, pick up these old gramophones, these old phonographs, these old radios for nothing. Maybe $5, $2, just practically nothing. Take them home, strip them apart, make them work. And sell them for two hundred dollars, two hundred and fifty dollars, and because this is the going price for for many of these antiques. Well, I think the conclusion that, 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 that this naturally leads you to is don't downgrade your own abilities, you know, but amplify them. Uh, everybody has something that's saleable, and uh, naturally, when you're a teenager, you tend to feel that well, adults can do it better. They'll look down on me, so and so and so forth. But uh, in actuality, uh, usually you'll find that adults are very pleased uh, to see this kind of initiative and will be really eager to give you business. I'd like to get back into some other ideas, and uh, here's a very obvious one that maybe you haven't thought of, and that is either start a caddying service at golf courses. Somebody is always doing this, and it, and it may as well be you, because there's always going to be a caddy needed. Uh, how about finding a lot somewhere and opening your, up, open your, own, your own parking lot? Get a bunch of your friends as attendants. Get a, maybe you hear about uh, uh, a big event that's coming to town, or maybe there's a there's some parking problem in your city. You arrange to open up your own parking lot. Uh, there, there are just a, just a myriad of ideas. For instance, helping the elderly. Uh, make it known that that this is a service that you want to be involved in. Helping old people uh, go to the market, shopping for them, reading to them, taking care of them one way or another. Uh, you could just go on and on. Make up a guidebook in your in your community. Make up a guidebook of your community, and uh, sell advertising space in it. Uh, it's another gap that should be filled if it doesn't exist. Well, here's an idea, and it's already being done in big cities, but I think it's very applicable in smaller cities. Go around to your restaurants uh, and collect menus from them. Put them together into a big folder and place these folders for a price in motels. So when somebody comes to the motel, an out-of-town salesman, he can look through the menus and see where he wants to eat. And, of course, the menus will be given to you for nothing. In fact, insist that they be given to you for nothing. And uh, you will be charging the motel. And we talked earlier about the 15-year-old kid and the dog-walking agency, but we haven't talked about the area of uh, pet grooming, pet boarding. Uh, for, some, for someone who likes animals, there's, there's just uh, no limit uh, to the amount of need there is for, for help, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, horses, you know. And um, uh, while we're speaking on horses, I have no more to say on that subject, <laughs> not being an expert on horses, but just that I know a lot of kids who have found work around stables. I'd like to go back to sector that menu idea I just said a moment ago. Uh, let me amend that. I think you should be charging the restaurant something on top of getting the menus. I think the attraction of the motel is it is free for them. Is placed free in their in their rooms. So get the menus off the restaurants. Plus, make a charge of let's say one dollar or two dollars for every motel in which their menu is placed in every motel. 
You know, it's always simply uh, a question of, of drive and imagination. Now, 17-year-old Bill Wilson uh, uh, of Parkersburg, West Virginia, makes $45 a week um, as an income tax consultant, and he does this after school, you know. That's his particular ability. And, uh, of course, that leads us to mice and frogs. Uh, they're lumped together because hospitals and research labs uh, have a need for both of them. And Jimmy Martin of Atlanta, Georgia, raised purebred, purebred pedigreed mice, which he sold to hospitals for experimental purposes. He began breeding when he was only 10 and built his business up so he was making $3,000 a year by the time he was in high school. Earthworms. Thousands of fishermen buy worms every weekend, and Bob Blackwell of Eugene, Oregon, raises them by the millions for a big profit. Well, if you're talking of earthworms, let's talk about crickets, chirping crickets. Uh, crickets make fantastic bait for fishermen. And uh, you can buy crickets, usually from the southern states, for about $15 a quart. But you can sell them for 30 to $40 a quart. Not just to fishermen, but also to uh, the owners of exotic pet stores with lizards and birds and snakes and what have you. And, of course, to zoos, because these creatures love crickets. Another very topical thing is ecology, and uh, you can actually pick up money out of the gutters. Uh, Reynolds Aluminum, I, I understand, pays you 10 cents a pound, or about a half cent each, for empty oil aluminum cans you can collect. Uh, in, fact, in fact, they'll also pay for aluminum frozen dinner cans and containers, aluminum margarine tubes, aluminum trays for fresher frozen bakery goods, and aluminum cans for dips and meat products and puddings, custards, and other snacks. Uh, aluminum cans are easy to spot, and uh, all many of them say all aluminum right on the can. Now, uh, Reynolds pays for this scrap at its uh, reclamation, reclamation center set up all over the country. And uh, for the address of a center near you, I understand you can write to the Public Relations Department at Reynolds Metal Company, 6601 Broad Street Road in Richmond, Virginia. Also, the Coca-Cola people are reclaiming glass bottles, and for information of where you can make money turning those in, write to the Coca-Cola Company Public Relations Department at 515 Madison Avenue in New York City. And there's money in old newspapers, and in this particular instance, I can talk from personal experience. I've sold over $2,000 worth of historical newspapers, which I got for free from Columbia University's library. And the way this came about was that I came to learn that the library was discarding these old historical papers uh, because they had been put on microfilm and they didn't have space for them. Uh, as you'll remember, I wrote an article for the Capitalist Reporter called How I Was Given $100,000 Worth of Rare Historical Newspapers, and you can get some too. Well, a lot of people laughed and thought this was a fluke incident and it could never happen again. Then the letters started coming in. We got a letter from a fellow in Houston, Texas, and he said, Well, Mr. Berman, thanks to the advice in your article, I've just picked up thousands of old Texas newspapers uh, describing uh, incidents from the Wild West. And a fellow from Vermont wrote in and said, well, thanks to the advice in your article, uh, uh, after I wrote to a library in Vermont, uh, they sent me free papers uh, describing George Washington's death. And in fact, these papers have real value. They're traded monthly in a publication called the Newspaper Collector's Gazette. Um, if we're talking about antiques, and of course these old papers are antiques, uh, let's talk of other antiques such as movie soundtrack albums. Now, I'm talking of soundtrack albums that came out in the early 1950s, let's say. Now, some of these albums are selling for $100 to $200 each. Now, what will they cost you? Not much. Uh, you can go around to old bookstores, and often these old bookstores have record bins selling for 50 cents, 75 cents each. Now, you can pick these up for that, and some of these are selling, as I say, for these very high prices, such as A Streetcar Named Desire, um, Quo Vadis, Rain Tree Country, God's Little Acre. All these are selling for $100 or more. Here are some more. Duel in the Sun, Forever Amber, Peyton Place. Now, suppose you, you get some, some of these albums. What will you do with them? Well, don't take them to a dealer, because, of course, a dealer will buy them off you at a wholesale price. Uh, much better go to your local library and find the name of some of the collector's publications. Get the names, get a copy of these publications, and you'll notice that people, there are page after page after page of classified ads. And people putting little classified saying, I've got this or that or whatever, uh, I want so many dollars for it. And so in other words, sell to other collectors through these collector's publications. Um, let's talk about old photos. 
old photos are surely one of the coming antique buys opportunity areas of the coming uh, few years. And I'm talking of old photos that oh the late 1800s. These are incredible buys in the trend-setting cities of, of the United States, that is New York, uh, San Francisco. Prices are starting to skyrocket. Now every home probably has some old photographs. Go around to your grandmother's or wherever. I'm not saying to strip the family collection, but keep in mind that there are many people getting rid of their old family collections at church bazaars or where have you because they don't realize how valuable they are. I'm talking of daguerreotypes. I'm talking of the old stereo cards, uh, or the stereo photos rather. Uh, these can be picked up for a dollar, fifty cents, a few pennies a piece. And now they're selling for five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, and sometimes over a hundred dollars. You know, the same type of skyrocketing is taking place uh, in a field that a lot of teenagers and uh, particularly young men are interested in, and that is autograph collecting. And uh, there's a very simple way to get a, ver to get a valuable autograph from a living figure, and this is a trick uh, told to me by Charles Hamilton, who's the top autograph dealer in the country. And that is, whoever your person is, zero in on who the person is, and let's say maybe it's George McGovern, pick out their most famous speech and pick out let's say the most potent lines in that speech. Type them, type them up on a piece of paper. Then write to the personality and say, Dear Mr. McGovern, or whoever it is, I'm an autograph collector, would, would you please sign this quote? What you get back is, and of course you won't always get it back, but you'll get it back a good percentage of the time, a person's most famous words on a, 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 an attractive piece of white paper suitable for framing with his signature, that makes the autograph worth 10, 15 times what it would just be written scrolled on a piece of paper. I know there are several people who have a, an interesting gimmick in this regard. Um, they write, they get a copy of the current Time magazine with the cover person on, and they write to that person asking them to please autograph their cover. And uh, these people have, have, oh heavens, well over a hundred Time magazines autographed with the uh, person's signature, and these are automatically very valuable. And if. Uh if you happen to save your old comic books, or if your father or mother did, well, this is another area that's burgeoning. The original uh, Superman comic book, uh, which came out in 1938, is now worth over $450 at auction. Uh, a lot of teenagers put out what they call fanzines, and these are magazines which advertise comics and go to other comic book collectors. There are over 10,000 old comic book collectors in the United States. Uh, very often, particularly if you live in a small town, uh, you can find buys in old comics uh, in, in, in old stores, just in attics, that, that <clears throat> are worth today 50 and $60 each. So uh, comic book collecting is another area to get into. Now, uh, a fellow with a lot of initiative in Hinesville, Illinois, started his own post office. He's a teenager and he's still in college. And uh, he's not doing anything illegal because he doesn't handle first-class mail. And the mail he does handle, he delivers in little bags on doorknobs of uh, private homes. And in the little town of Hinesville, Illinois, he's handling 5,000 pieces of mail a week uh, because he can, he can charge less than the post office charges, and he has 15 employees there uh, driving around Hinesville, Illinois, delivering circulars, leaflets, uh, whatever commercial concern has to get out to people in Hinesville. You know, getting back to comic books, um, I wanted to give some addresses around the country where anyone uh, listening who wanted to get in the old comic business uh, could write and get started and give a catalog. Uh, the biggest dealer is a fellow named Phil Suling, S-E-U-L-I-N-G, at 2883 West 12th Street in Brooklyn, New York, and his zip is 11224. Another big dealer out on the West Coast is Richard Alf, A-L-F. And he's at 2866 Monarch Street, San Diego, California. And the zip there is 92123. The biggest magazine for comic book collectors is called The Comic Collector. And there you write to The Comic Collector, Department M5, 9875 Southwest 212th Street, Miami, Florida, 33157. Now here's a very uh, exciting area we haven't gotten into yet, and that is the area of teenage modeling. You know, there's a teenage girl uh, I met here in Brooklyn a few weeks ago. Her name is Franny Michelle, 
and she made $15,000 off just two television commercials for baggies, plastic bags. Um, the man who publishes a publication called Mini Model News says there are at least 50 or 60 kids making over $100,000 a year in modeling. And uh, he says there are another several hundred making above $20,000 a year in modeling. And basically, to, to get into television commercial modeling or, or acting in situation comedies and this sort of thing, you have to make up what's called a composite. It's a set of pictures of you in various poses and then send them to various model agencies. So what, what I'm going to do here is give you a list of some of the agencies that hire models. And you don't have to be a real pretty face because this is the age of nat naturalism and uh, you just may be the type of person that will appeal to, him, appeal to them. A big one in New York is the Mary Ellen White Agency at 370 Lexington Avenue. Uh, you write there to 370 Lexington Avenue, room 711, New York 10017. Out in Los Angeles, you can write to the Central Model Agency, 422 Southwestern, Los Angeles, California, 90020. And in Chicago, write to, the Shirley ha write to Shirley Hamilton Incorporated, 360 North Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, 60601. Now, the magazine I mentioned a, mi a minute ago called Mini Model News uh, is a very important thing to be getting monthly if you want to get into this field. And for that, write to Mini Model News, Post Office Box 784, Madison Square Station, New, New York, New York, 10010. And if you want to know what shows are casting at any particular time, this will cost you $6, but it will be well worth it, write for a copy of Ross Reports, care of Jerry Leiter, Television Index, 155th Avenue, New, New York, New York, 10011. Another good idea is to essentially become a travel agent, but you don't really become an agent. You become what travel agencies refer to as an outsider. In other words, you're someone who brings them in uh, a large amount of business and who, to whom they pay a commission, maybe 35 or 40 percent. Uh, the way you become an outsider is to have a lot of contacts, or at least uh, for your parents to have a lot of contacts. If you're someone whose parents belong to a lot of political organizations, are very active in the community, uh, have, them, have them talk to these people about having you plan their next vacation or their next group trip. Then you approach, you approach uh, various travel agents in your city and you say, listen, I can deliver 200 people to you. What percentage will you give me? The one who offers you the highest percentage, that's the one you work through. And, of course, by working through him as a so-called outsider, um, you don't have to register for anything or you don't have to get any particular special license. He's the one who has to go through all that. Uh, there, are, there are stories that have come through here of teenagers making uh, two, three hundred dollars a week as outsiders for a travel agency. Uh, here's a somewhat ruthless idea you might try. Get a job at a, a pet washing and grooming store. Uh, learn from the manager how to groom dogs and, and animals, how to take care of them, whatever the services of that store is. And then go out into competition with them once you've learned how to, how to groom animals and uh, put a little ad in the paper. And because you can operate right from your own home, uh, you can charge much less because you have no overhead, practically none. You know, there have been uh, several good uh, pocketbooks which are readily available uh, that have been published uh, on the subject of uh, teenage business, and uh, I'd really recommend uh, anybody listening picking up these books. One is called The Independent Teenager. It's by a fellow named David Rubin, and uh, I'll give you the address. Uh, if you can't find it in, in your local bookstore, then write away to... Uh, Collier Books in New York. It's part of a uh, career guide series that they have. Now another book, and, and this one is another terrific, uh, has full of terrific suggestions for teenage businesses, and that's called 101 Summer Jobs by Roberta Ashley. Um, if you can't get a hold of that in your local bookstore, then write to Tempo Books, Grasset and Dunlap Incorporated, 51 Madison Avenue, New York City, New York, 10010, and that's 101 summer jobs. Another book uh, that I strongly recommend <coughs> you get a hold of 
is, uh, as soon as I find it in the, the papers that I have here, um, a book called Campus Jobs. And that's one that uh, gives you a lot of suggestions for how to make money uh, around all the events going on on a college campus. And the, book, the, book, the name of the book is How to Succeed in Business Before Graduating. It's by uh, Peter Sandman and Don Goldenson, and it's published by the Macmillan Company. So those are three very good books, and they're chock full of ideas for teenage businesses. Of course, uh, in anything like this, it's a matter of applying some, uh, bit, some just good common sense with some hard business practice training, and, and I wonder if you'd have any comments on that. Well, assuming you have an idea in which to start your business, it is vitally important that you plan out what you're going to do. You plan out step one, step two, step three, step four. You plan out uh, how much money you'll need, for example. You, bu you give yourself a budget, and you realistically budget your plans because you could be unrealistic and you could end up needing far more money than, than you, um, you, know, you, you think to begin with. Uh, possibly... You know, you I'll, I'll interrupt you a second. That reminds me, uh, be before you go on, uh, a, a, a terrific way to learn how to run a small business is what they call the Junior Achievement Program in all high schools. And uh, the, the, these Junior Achievement Programs actually set up a business for a term, and I forget the actual percentages, but I think 95% of these businesses have been profitable. Uh, so if you, if you want to learn how to run a small business, I highly recommend that you get involved in your local Junior Achievement Program. Well, the nice thing about Junior Achievement, of course, is that successful businessmen in the community uh, actually lend their expertise to help you, you and your friends, your associates, to get launched. And here you're actually doing something. It's a going, it's a going business, but you're operating with other fellows, girls, and you have people who, who have really good business background uh, helping you helping get started and making it successful. Now, on your own business, uh, you may want to register a company. Now, there's nothing to it. You don't need a lawyer. You don't need hundreds of dollars. It's really very simple. Uh, one, I should caution you, though, there could be um, a regulation or a law that prohibits anybody under a certain age registering a company. But you can check that out. The main thing is uh, contact City Hall. Tell them you'd like to register a company. If they can't do it, they'll put you on to whoever can. They merely tell you where to pick up the papers, usually at a business supply store. You fill them out. You go to your the, the office, be it City Hall or the courthouse or wherever, and you um, pay about $5. And presto, there you are with uh, your own company. And it's all legal and it's all official. And, of course, then you can open up a business account at the bank. But uh, do check and see if in your state whether there's anything prohibit prohibiting anybody under a certain age starting their own company. We've given people a lot of ideas on this cassette for uh, small businesses they can start, but I assume there are hundreds of ideas out there that we here at the Capitalist Reporter haven't even heard of. And uh, so I want to stress again that it's really a matter of finding the need in your community. I heard about one teenager <coughs> who started a repair service in which he went around uh, around the community and located the people who were best at fixing all sorts of specific things, your television repairman, your plumber, so on and so forth. And he said to these people, listen, if I got you work, would you give me a commission on, on every job I get you, say 10 or 15 percent? Then he began to advertise his repair service and charge a double commission because as his name grew and people knew that he was supplying the most reliable work in the city, uh, they were willing to pay him 10 or 15 percent just to locate someone at any hour, night and day, to fix what they needed fixed. Now, this is just uh, um, another example of ingenuity and, and drive, and uh, I understand that the, this fellow carried his teenage business on into his adult life and is still running the service. Now, of course, a very common teenage business <clears throat> is supplying uh, musical bands for weddings, for various affairs, and uh, you don't necessarily have to be the one who plays an instrument. <clears throat> maybe you can locate a group of friends and be their manager. And in fact, maybe you can become a sort of a local theatrical manager and supplying clowns and magicians, as we mentioned earlier, all sorts of entertainers for parties and events. Uh, you have to have a bent in this direction, but if you do, it's a terrific little business to get into. 
Yeah, that's a very good idea because all you'd be is just a packager. That is, you package the talent. You find the talent and you sell that talent package uh, to people who, who want that services, be it to weddings or groups or whatever. And you bring the two sides together. And for that service, you rake off so much off the top. The point here is, of course, with all these businesses, that nothing comes easy. Uh, it sounds very simple when it rolls off the mouth, but it takes a lot of hard work. And, it's going to, and in most of these cases, it's going to take talking to a lot of people in your community, asking for help, uh, looking for periodicals, books in the library on the subject that you're interested in. And um, don't feel that, that in any of these instances you're just going to go out and, and the money is going to come pouring in overnight. And there's a lot of research involved to find out if you really have a market. It's very easy to think that people are going to come breaking down your door, uh, but, but you don't know until you ask people themselves, are they interested in this particular product or service? How many people are interested? Is it worth your while to get into, into a big endeavor? Uh, it reminds me of a story in marketing that I was told in school uh, about a new uh, dog food a company was thinking of putting on the market, and uh, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in research asking dog owners, if we were to put out this particular food, would you buy it? And the, the idea was so good, everyone thought, that 80, 90 percent of the people said, yes, I'd definitely buy that. They took the product, <clears throat> put it out on the market, and the problem was that the dogs didn't like it. Another important thing is that, talking about liking, is that you yourself must like the venture you get into. If you're only motivated by pure greed, thinking here's a fast buck, here's a way I can make lots and lots of money, uh, you very likely could be disappointed. You must do things you like. So there's, your, there's a double satisfaction. There's a satisfaction, hopefully, of making money, and there's a satisfaction of doing something you really enjoy. You know, another teenage business that's a lot of fun and very profitable, and that is running a dating service in your community. And uh, these started in the big cities and, and uh, still uh, have not reached out to a lot of the medium-sized towns. Uh, running a dating service is great, first of all, because uh, you get all the best dates. <laughs> when someone calls, uh, if there's someone who appeals to you, well, then you can go out with them, and the rest, the rest of the dates you pass along to your subscribers. But, but seriously, uh, it's, it's a, and again, all these same principles of promotion uh, apply to uh, running a dating service. Uh, I don't think you'd want to get into the, to the extent of, of running a computerized dating service, but if you did, it's always possible to rent a computer for an hour once a, once a month from a computer company and put the names in. But probably on the scale you'll be working, it would just be a matter of, of uh, making up a brochure and, and matching up uh, various characteristics of people who uh, would like to go out with each other. Now, a spin-off from this is throwing single, singles parties in your communities. Uh, here in New York, of course, uh, this is a gigantic business, even to the extent where they have uh, 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 ship lines have si three-day singles cruises to nowhere, where you just uh, hundreds of singles go out on a ship and, and uh, float around for three days. But uh, there's a vast area in the, in the um, field of getting single people together to meet each other, and uh, single people uh, have a lot of money to spend on socializing, uh, a lot of money put aside for this purpose. So again, here's an area where you can tap a need. Now, uh, we talked uh, near the er near early in this tape about the idea of a health food push cart. And of course, that's only one thing that you can take around the streets. But in New York, for example, a peddler's license costs $2. And there are just hundreds of things just walking down Fifth Avenue on a Saturday that young people are selling on the street. Uh, another suggestion, uh, similar to the health food push cart and, and, and now catching on a great deal in New York City is a flower stand, a push wheel flower stand where you sell a bunch of flowers for 50 cents or a dollar, maybe cheaper than the flower store you've got your cart sitting in front of. And that's the reason that the police often chase the people who are selling things over the streets away, but they're very rarely arrested. Uh, there are other people who uh, use a little kind of compressing machine and will put your picture on a button for a dollar. They take your picture with a color Polaroid camera and make a button for you. I don't know where you locate this machine. You'd have to do some research. But a lot of young people are taking those around New York. Uh, what about the idea of starting a moving agency? Well, in uh, New York City, a number of people have uh, started such agencies. And the advantage is, of course, that they can undercut the regular moving agencies. The regular moving vans or whatever, they're unionized. So automatically, 
the, uh, the price has to be sky high. Secondly, of course, the moving company has to support an office overhead, uh, staff, you know, it's the whole paraphernalia of a whole going organization. Now, all you have to do is find out who wants to be moved, and you and one or two or three of your friends, you go down and you rent a truck or get somebody to rent a truck for you. So you don't have any standing overhead of supporting it. You just use your truck when you need it. And um, in New York, the going price is about, oh, eight or nine or ten dollars an hour. Uh, this usually is one person, for one person. Now, if you want, if there's a bigger job, of course, you had two people, then you might charge a bit more. Of course, a lot, a lot of uh, businesses depend on the kind of source material they have available to them. Information is very important, and, and we've been uh, the reason we have uh, so many of these ideas is we've been collecting inf this sort of information here at the Capitalist Reporter. But if anyone listening has any questions on teenage business, we'd be glad to do the research and answer them. So if there are any further questions which haven't been covered on this tape, just write to Teenage Business Editor, the Capitalist Reporter, 155th Avenue. New York 10011, and we'll answer your questions the best we can. This has been cassette number 122 in the Capitalist Reporter Commercial Intelligence Program.